This is Shannon Wong, podcast number four. And today I'm going to talk about a little uh, philosophy to, out of the gate. There's a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, Heraclitus of Ephesus, and he's credited for writing about war, where he stated, out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't even be there. 80 are just targets. Nine are the real fighters, and we're lucky to have them, for they make the battle. Ah, but the one, the one is a warrior, and he will bring the others back. And I'd like to think that we all aspire to be that warrior, that individual who could make the biggest impact on the battlefield and in life. And today, we're honored to have such an individual join us on the podcast, Uday Devgan. Wow, Shannon, you're, this is me blushing. You are too <laughs> kind. You know, I don't know if I'm a warrior per se, but I'm definitely passionate, passionate about what I do. And I think that's kind of the difference between truly excelling at something mm -hmm. and doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a little background on Uday. Um, he's an ophthalmologist in private practice at Devgan Eye Surgery in Los Angeles, California. And he's a partner at Specialty Surgical Center in Beverly Hills, California. He served as Chief of Ophthalmology at All of You UCLA Medical Center since 2008. And he served as a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA School of Medicine, where he served as a faculty member since 2000 and has been awarded the Ophthalmology Department's Teaching Award five times. He has personally instructed over 160 ophthalmology residents since 2000 and has served as the attending physician for approximately 500 surgical procedures per year over the past 22 years. I know how to attend a good resident case. <laughs> no matter what the resident does in the OR, my blood pressure and pulse will be nice and low and even. It's a lot of stress that they put you through, so huh? it's a lot of stress. So because of his outstanding teaching teaching skills, he has been invited to serve as the keynote speaker at over 100 eye meetings over the past decade, including visiting professorships and being the keynote speaker at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida, Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, and New York University. He's an author of books and book chapters on ophthalmology, published in peer-reviewed journals in ophthalmology as well. And recently, in 2021, Newsweek Magazine published America's Best Eye Doctors 2021, where Uday Devgan was ranked number three in the best ophthalmologist. Now, in you US. know, my mom gave me a lot of grief for that. <laughs> she said, why weren't you one or two? That's right. I was like, mom. Second those loser. Guys, she says, those guys, I said, those guys are older than me. She says, that's good. Then you have time to catch up. That's true. So I don't think I can ever be good enough for my own parents. No, that's quite a, it's quite an honor. So these achievements have established Dr. Devgan as one of the most influential ophthalmologists in the United States. But perhaps Uday's greatest legacy and the way that he is able to touch the lives of the most people as a physician is through his website, cataractcoach.com, where he categorizes his teaching videos about cataract surgery, lens implants, life, and the practice of ophthalmology. And to date, there are over 1,300 videos, which 1,400 and change now. 1,400. <laughs> which are all available on YouTube if you search the term Uday Devgan or Cataract Coach. And these have, his channel has over 12 million views and 37 to 38,000 subscribers. And Uday for me personally, I'm a subscriber and I watch all your videos daily because you post daily. And by watching your videos on YouTube and learning from you, I'm a better surgeon and my patients receive better care. So... Thanks. I, Thanks for coming I, on the podcast. My pleasure. An honor to be here. I actually become a better surgeon, and I actually learn more than I contribute by making those videos. It's and yeah, a lot the of one work. the one a day is uh, when I first started this in 2018, about 1,400 and something days ago. I had an idea of like maybe I'll post a video a week, something of this nature. And as you know, it's a lot of work to make a video, edit it, do a title slide, a voiceover, upload it, all the. It's a lot of work. But then I said, you know, let me hold myself to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. I want to see if I can do one a day. And then I, I did it for a week and 
it's all right, I got a seven-day streak. And next thing you know, I've got a 100-day streak and 500-day streak. I'm like, I can't stop now. I can't get off the train. So you'll keep going as, as long as you can. I can never predict the future. Uh -huh. I've never been great at predicting the future. Mm -hmm. But I'm enjoying making the videos, and I learn so much. Mm -hmm. I get, obviously, my own videos, but I also feature videos that are submitted to me. And I get five to ten video submissions a day. So there's no shortage of surgical footage to, to review and to learn from. That's time consuming just to watch somebody else's video. Oh, 100%. <laughs> so, like all great stories, and the purpose of today's podcast is for the audience to get to know you better. So, let's start at the beginning. And where did you grow up? So, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, so for me, it's home. My high school is about five miles away from my main clinic. I went to Santa Monica High School, and, and then I just stayed local. In high school, I was very much uh, into studying, especially math. I was on the math team. Mm -hmm. Didn't have the skills to make the baseball team, mm -hmm. but I definitely made the math team. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, kind of parlayed me into going to UCLA for college, which is, of course, also very local, mm -hmm. just down the street. UCLA was, a, gosh, a, at the time, essentially free. Mm -hmm. So my parents were like, well, you're going to the low-cost option. Mm -hmm. So and UCLA is a fantastic school. I really enjoyed my time there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was good to stay local. I, I did med school at USC across town, mm -hmm. which I thought was a fantastic medical school. And the reason is, is because of the big county hospital. USC is a huge county hospital, public type hospital, where the patients are the sweetest people you've ever met. The faculty are passionate about teaching you, and you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the most important thing. And it's kind of the metric I use is like, in med school, I, I wanted to do a small surgical subspecialty, ENT, maybe neurosurgery, maybe ophthalmology. I didn't like OB. Even then, in six weeks of the OB rotation, I delivered 31 babies. That's how busy that county hospital was. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, and the opportunities were endless. It was just a fantastic place to do medical school. I loved it. So what was, if we go back to 14 to 17 year old Uday, wh what were your activities? What was your personality like? Who would we see if we were to go back in time and look at sophomore, or junior, high school Uday? Always pretty driven. I mean, the, the, first, the first day of high school, I went to the admin office, and I said I'd like to request the, what's the criteria used for valedictorian selection. And so then a few years later when I graduated, I, I was valedictorian. Because so I had that paper on the wall in my, be in my bedroom wall, and I would look at it and like, that's what I got to achieve. I got to do this. Was that you wanted that, or did your parents go... We want you to basically. No, my four do siblings. That. I was the only one who was valedictorian. Uh huh. They're all smarter than me, but maybe not as passionate slash crazy as me. Mm hmm. But no, my parents were very hands off. Mm -hmm. And, and the funny thing is that worked. And my parents were both, 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 uh, both doctors, and all four kids in my family, me and all siblings, were all doctors too. That's and amazing. my parents didn't push it at mm -hmm. all. In fact, when I finished, when I was graduating college, they were like, listen, if you, if you want to go to med school, we'll pay for it. That sounds like a pretty good, or you just get out there and get a job, do what else you want to do. Now, your parents, what, what, what kind of background did they have? I mean, they're both retired physicians now. They're mm -hmm. hanging in there. They're getting up there in age. Mm -hmm. And um, What kind of physicians? My dad did ENT, ear, nose, throat, mm -hmm. otolaryngology, and my mom kind of did more general practice and derm towards the end. She liked that more mm -hmm. but they worked very hard they were great examples and i think they always treated from the heart mm -hmm. and i think that was really very important and they also had challenges against against them that we or i didn't have to suffer like what well you know my dad the, when he, we grew up there was a hospital i won't say the name of it in in santa monica and mm -hmm. they wouldn't give him privileges because he's a you know funny name mm -hmm. like, like me mm -hmm accent, didn't, didn't do med school in America. Mm -hmm. so it was very easy for them to discriminate against him. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the first things I did when I finished my residency was get privileges in that hospital, mm -hmm. do surgeries there. Mm -hmm. Just so my dad could have some kind of closure then. Mm -hmm. Here did, you go. You, and, and you know, he said, he said, you should definitely do it. He says, they can't say no to you. 
You're totally American. You schooled here, trained here, everything here. What are they going to say? No, they can't. And so you're number two of four children, right? Yeah, but my dad used to travel a lot, so you never know for sure. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> joking. Just four kids. I'm number two in the lineup. And so the oldest is what type of physician? My oldest sister did ENT training, and that is mostly facial plastics. And then there's you, and there's then me. the th number three? She's an MD, brilliant, brilliant person, doesn't actually practice medicine, does business stuff. Okay. And, and then, then number four? That's my youngest sister. She's actually a, a really famous plastic surgeon in New York City, Lara Devgan, L-A-R-A -A is the first name. Very cool. And she's, uh, she's by far the smartest of all the siblings in my family. So did your parents, uh, how did they kind of, why did you guys all choose medicine? Is it just because you saw your parents doing medicine? I think that's a big part of it. They were uh -huh. really happy in what they did. They really mm -hmm. enjoyed their work, mm -hmm. and it didn't seem like work to them. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't 100% convinced about med school until after I started it. Mm -hmm. And my parents, remember, they said they'd pay for it. And so they paid that tuition. Mm -hmm. And I started med school. And the first week of med school, I was blown away. They're teaching you the secrets of the whole body. And at the time in college, I was like into weightlifting and this and that. And mm -hmm. to understand how the, I think the muscle physiology just convinced me in a second. I've got to really master the subject because this is, they're teaching you the secrets of the whole body. When you learn that, oh, you have to stress a muscle to at least 80% of its maximum ability to get hypertrophy. And I, I paid really good attention because mm -hmm. it was applicable to me. Or they learned about, oh, you know, I had a rotator cuff injury in, in, in college from poor form in bench press. Mm -hmm. And then you learn about, oh, the four muscles that make up the rotator cuff and why the glenohumeral joint is so susceptible. I just, I just loved it. Mm -hmm. And so as they taught you more and more, med school to me was amazing. I, I, I didn't miss a single lecture in med school. In person, the in whole person. way. Yeah, this is different than modern day. I'm an old guy. I finished That's med right. school in 96. No virtual. I actually <laughs> went to every single lecture, mm -hmm. and I pretended like every lecture to me was like a movie. And I want to just enjoy that movie and take as many details as possible. Mm. So I wouldn't burden myself with a tremendous amount of notes. In fact, I had a rule. Eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. You had one, I had allowed myself only one side of a piece of paper of notes for each hour of lecture. That's it. So I could write down the important things and not some minutiae details that aren't that critical. That's a pretty good tip, actually. It forces you to be efficient. Right. Uh-huh. So you went to UCLA. What did you study at UCLA? I was initially kind of disillusioned from the sciences. And so I spent a couple of years as a French major. Mm -hmm. And UCLA, you can't blame me. It's the, the prettier part of campus, the prettier girls. Class, instead of, the, instead of that biology class with 500 kids, the French class has 30 or 20. It's a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, I kind of made a realization that um, I probably am not going to do so much in life with a French major. Mm -hmm. So I switched to microbio and molecular genetics. That was like sophomore year or freshman year? Junior year. Oh, really? So instead of the two-year plan for college, a uh, four-year plan for college, I did, I did the five-year plan. Oh, interesting. I had to switch gears. Those two years of French kind of were useless. You didn't take basic chemistry or physics? In, in my first year, I did. Uh -huh. I took chemistry, calculus, whatever. But then I kind of got disillusioned after a while. I was like, you know, this is kind oh, of interesting. enough of the sciences. Let me, let me have some fun. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And how was UCLA? It's a long time ago. It's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, it's a huge school. I think it's the number one school in terms of total number of applications received, like 150,000 applications, which makes me wonder. I don't even read them. And especially the UCs have done something a little bit odd, and they've thrown away the SAT or ACT. Mm. So all the UC schools now don't want to take that into consideration, which to me was, I'm more fashion. I kind of believe in merit. And if you have a universal test that everyone takes, and though it may have flaws, it's still the same test given to everyone. And you can study for the same test. And now the official partner for the SAT to learn the material, and they give the best material to the Khan Academy, which is free. So I don't know if the SAT is that evil of a thing. I, I happen to agree. So five years at UCLA. Well, four and two, four and two thirds, four and two quarters. Four I just couldn't. The other, you know, the other problem with UCLA as a huge school was you just were unable to get the even back then the classes you want. They're full. Sorry. 
you can't get the class you want on time. There are just so many students right. there. What's the enrollment at UCLA? I'd have to Google it to tell you for sure, but I'm sure it's, I'm guessing eight or 10,000 freshmen a year. I'd say eight-ish, let's guess. So about thirty to 40,000 total. Yeah, it's probably like UT Austin, a yeah. very huge state school, which is their upsides and their downsides. The yeah. upside is it's so big, you've got a gazillion different little clubs and groups that you can kind of you know, fit right in, but then you sometimes get lost in the big crowds, especially, I don't get the idea of these humongous 500 people classes, like you're sitting in this big movie theater, mm -hmm. and the professor's way down 100 yards away, about that big. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's great learning. Mm -hmm. And now I understand why the new generation says, no, I'll just watch the video online. That's right. In, in 2x speed. Right. So it just makes you wonder, mm -hmm. what's the future of this stuff? I think the more interactive learning mm -hmm. tends to be more useful. Mm -hmm. So you're, at what point in your undergrad experience did you go, I think I'm going to pursue medicine. And what, was, what were you considering prior to that? So you, you're studying French. So maybe you had some other plan at that point. Well, my hobbies at the time were things like electronics. Mm -hmm. So I've always been looking into electronics, audio, designing my own speakers, the cro even the crossover networks. I mean, I love the physics part of, you know, of electronics. And so I considered something along those lines. But, you know, honestly, the game changers, my parents said, well, you go to med school, we'll pay for it. Like, wow, I just... It kind of buys me time. Let me just try it. Worst case scenario, I can quit after a while. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened. I went and just, wow, maybe, maybe my parents are on something. This is kind of fun. And my sister was at the same med school two years ahead of me at mm -hmm. USC. And she was loving it. She was, said it was fantastic. And so I was like, you know, I should do this. Is your sister a, uh, your, your number two, is she a very good, was she a, a very influential role model oh, for you? Best sister ever. Are you kidding me? Best sister ever. Always kept me out of trouble. Always looked after me. Just the best sister ever. I, I, I'm, in fact, I, I see that among my own kids where my daughter to my son is two years older and kind of has that same relationship that I had with my older sister. And it was, she's, she's, she was a blessing to, in my life as a kid. Yeah, I think that's very uh, fortuitous because if you have that oldest sibling who's driven and kind of follows uh, uh, the rules, so to speak and they're ambitious, it, it kind of, I think it does have a big impact on the younger siblings. Plus it made life easy in high school. You walk into a class and they'd see the last name, it's like, oh, you're Kay's brother. I'm like, boom, automatic A. <laughs> okay. All right, so then you're at you're UCLA, yeah. and then did you apply to multiple medical schools? Yeah, so we applied to multiple medical schools. I think I'm so happy I you know, went to USC and graduated from USC. It's, to me, it was the absolute best fit. Just a great med school. Again, the hands-on there is, was just, at the time, especially unparalleled. You didn't want to leave California. You were okay staying in oh, L.A. Oh, for sure. Uh -huh. I love L.A. Uh -huh. But here's the best part. Like, I'll give you an example. I'm, 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 I'm doing some rotation beginning of med school, first couple of years, and some patient has some laceration, and they say, oh, you can do your med student when we sew this up, and you're... I've learned, I practice, and I do it, and I, at the end, it just, it's not that pretty. I didn't do a pretty job. I felt so guilty about this that the county hospital had a LAC room, L-A-C, or our abbreviation for laceration. The laceration room was basically, everyone who came in the ER with any kind of laceration went there. PAs, or physician assistants, sewed up all of them except the face, where they had, like, some, you know, intern or resident do it. So I would go there. Because I'm an old guy, I had a, a disc man. This is like a little thing that plays CDs. Those are these silver discs that have music on them instead of an MP3 player for the younger audience. Sony. I'd use my Sony disc man. I'd play some mm -hmm. music, and I'd just sit there and practice suturing. And I'd go there like on a Saturday in med school. I don't have anything else to do. And I'd go there from the early morning, 6, 7 in the morning. I'd, I'd do about 8, 10, 12 hours of just suturing until I could just get it so pretty and i don't i want to learn all the stitches i want to try okay let me try a subcuticular stitch with the proline let me see this let me do a double a multiple layered one. these are on patients yes as a medical student yes and there's the and there there's they line out the door were there other medical students who were doing very, this very few uh-huh some interns or residents would like the the ones who are doing plastics want to go there and practice make sure their clothes are really beautiful i'd learn from them i say hey, i'm a med student do you mind if you, you know teach me a little bit so it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, what a, what a blessing. USC for med school 
is hands down, I think, one of the best places to train for hands-on work just because you do so much. Mm -hmm. How many students are in each class at UC? I don't, UC? Yeah, I don't know what the numbers are these, these days, but... Um, Back in the day, what was it for maybe you? Maybe 180-ish, Okay, 180, good size school. Yeah, we were the same. How, many, how much time did you guys spend in the basic sciences? I think it was two years of the basic sciences and straight to the two years of the clinical rotations. Okay. The neat part of USC, the county hospital, you've got to speak Spanish. Remember, I'm a guy who was not that bright. I took French. French is not very useful in a county hospital where 85% 80 of the patients speak Spanish. So I had to learn Spanish. I'll tell you a really funny story. So I'd make notes. I, I learned by like jotting down a phrase. And I said, listen, if I can learn one phrase or word a day, after a year, it's pretty good. After a few years, it's amazing. So I make this list, and I had the nurse tell me, can you help me write down, like, to ask the patient, how old are you? And so in Spanish, the way you say it is, how many years do you have? And she wrote it down for me, and I didn't know there was an N and N -ye. N -ye is the N that has the squiggly on top. So I read the card of the patient, and the patient said, I said, ¿Cuántos años tiene usted? The patient said, solo uno. Well, just ask the patient how many anuses they have. Oh. Because <laughs> anos is anus. Yes. Años is years. Yes. So the, patient, the nurse just, just about fell out of her chair laughing. <laughs> I'm asking the patient how many anuses he has. He says, solo uno, only one doctor. So you learn Spanish on your own. Claro que sí. Y ahorita puedo hablar todo en español sin problema. Oh, perfecto. Right. So it's like I just learned it by just being around and speaking it. How much French did you retain? Almost nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Very little. Yeah. So you're, you're in medical school, and then how did you, what, what kind of thoughts did you have in terms of the residency that you might gravitate toward? So when I started med school, I knew I loved to work with my hands, right? I spent you know, countless hours in the lab practicing, countless hours in the laceration room. So I wanted to work with my hands. Mm -hmm. I did like, the, one of the first rotations that I just thought was amazing was neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. But neurosurgery was amazing. It was a ton of hard work. And those guys just lived it, ate it, breathed it. The catch there was, I don't think I ever saw a neurosurgery patient who said, thanks for the brain surgery. I feel so much better. And also, the, the, the brain surgeons, the neurosurgeons, didn't have a great work-life balance. Mm -hmm. They're essentially married to the hospital. And I knew that didn't want that to be me either. Mm -hmm. Then I liked ENT like my dad. But of the ENT, the only parts I liked, and actually the research I did when I was a first or second year med student was otology. I liked otology and neurotology. So ears, a hearing, skull-based stuff. And that, interestingly, ophthalmology is microscope-based. Looking through a microscope in order to operate. Right, for nose surgery, you're not using a big microscope, but for ear surgery, you're definitely using a surgical microscope. And I like that the most. So the, one of the initial papers I published as a junior author was a pediatric tympanoplasty paper in, like, I don't know, 1993, two, something, long ago. And I just really liked it. And I only happened to stumble on ophthalmology when I, I did a, I had a, a time to do electives. I said, oh, I got some six weeks of electives. I'm going to do three weeks of, I think I did like plastic surgery and then three weeks of ophthalmology. And I was blown away with ophthalmology. Because like most med schools, they don't have a ton of exposure to it in med school in the first two years. You get that one day of lectures about the eyeball, that's about it. Mm -hmm. But I was blown away. This and is was, like year three, year four? In my, in, towards the end of my third year. Mm -hmm. And I was so enamored with it that when you we did the three week rotation, the, 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 at the time, the goal was your first week, you just kind of watch and learn. Your second week and your third week, each of those weeks, see one patient on your own and then present it to the attending. And I want you to, and you sort of write up like a half page or a one page kind of synopsis of the patient and what you learned and what the disease process was, et cetera. And then turn those two in at the end of the rotation. I turned in 42 of them instead of two of them. I was just so into it. And there was a resident at the time who I just met with when I gave a lecture last month in Florida. His name was Shalesh Koshal. Dr. Koshal is a retina specialist in kind of that central Florida area. He was a resident there at USC when I was a med student. And his work ethic 
was so unbelievable. And here's why I say that. He was, I think, a first year resident. And we're in the clinic seeing patients and I'm working with him and he's a super bright guy. This is, I mean, he's genius level. And he's a Yale undergrad. He did a PhD at MIT in, in Karana's lab, an MIT, a uh, Nobel Prize winner at MIT. Then he did med school at Hopkins and he's there for residency. This guy's beyond, is twice my IQ on a bad day. Mm-hmm. And his work ethic was such that the, some of the senior residents, this is towards the end of the junior, so it's probably like May or June, senior residents are going to graduate in a, a, a month or two. They'd get the charts of the patients that they're waiting to see that doctor, and they'd just put them in his box and say, hey, Shalish, take care of those for me. I'm, gonna, I'm leaving earlier today. Instead of complaining, he said, thank you. That's a great opportunity for me to learn. I'll take great care of your patients. And so we would routinely, and, and the, uh, multiple seniors would give him stacks of charts to see those patients. And I'd stay there with him. We'd do two rooms. After I saw my patient, he'd, I'd bring him in the room. He'd, he'd, he'd examine the patient also and say, good job, or disagree. or say, oh, let me teach you something. He'd stay there till 8 o'clock at night, just cranking through these. And his attitude was, what a beautiful opportunity for me to learn. So what about ophthalmology? Go, did you go, oh, wow, I love this. What did you love about it well, as a medical student? I loved my role in the math team. Everything we do is math. Everything is math, especially cataract refractive. Nothing but math. Patients who may be watching this, astigmatism is addition and subtraction of vectors. That's all it is. Magnitude and direction, magnitude, that's all it is. Like the plane flies this way and the, the wind blows that way, where does the plane end up? That's astigmatism. So I loved the math part of it. I loved microsurgery. Back from the otology days and skull-based surgery and the acoustic neuroma surgeries. I loved microscopic small surgery. I loved the precision there. Mm-hmm. And probably the most amazing in ophthalmology was the patients are so happy. They're blown away happy. You know, the closest thing to an absolute modern miracle of medicine is a white cataract in a five or 10 minute surgery that patient can have, bam, 20, 20 vision the next day. Mm -hmm. That is, that's biblical. That is amazing. So all that together just blew me away, and I was like, I just have to do ophthalmology. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then you, you, uh, you're in medical school. You're going to apply for a residency program. Uh, did you look for programs outside of California? I did. I interviewed all over the place. Mm-hmm. At the time, it was different. It's not like now where your average resident applies like 70-some programs, 7-0. No, I applied to a handful, a dozen or so. Programs I liked, I, li- I thought Baskin was amazing. I interviewed there. I thought Wills was fantastic. I really liked Mass Ioneer. I loved Baylor. Baylor was so hands-on, too. That's before they had the whole split with the, you know. Methodist. Yeah, uh-huh. Methodist Hospital. Without UT Southwestern. Wow, what a big, busy place. Parkland Hospital was like my med school I, on another level, even. All these programs were great, I thought. I thought Seattle, University of Washington, Seattle was at the time, this is 25 years ago, was amazing because they had a huge catch basin of where patients come from. Huge states, and multiple states feed into them. But I liked USC a lot, and I liked UCLA. But at the time, remember, this is 1995 when I'm applying. This is when there was huge budget cuts, and there was a question whether or not the county of LA would close County USC Hospital. In, US, in the way you see it, Los Angeles is split with the county hospitals. There are three big county hospitals. Two of them are part of the UCLA, which is all of UCLA, which is where I was formerly chief for many years, of chief ophthalmology. There's Harbor UCLA, and there's LA County USC. So if they close the LA County USC, that program is, wow, in trouble. Because that's, that's 95% of your volume. Whereas UCLA had two VAs, two county hospitals, plus Westwood, plus UCLA is a fantastic place. I said, let me just change gears here a little bit. And so I ranked UCLA one, I I matched there, and I enjoyed my time there as well. So I kind of got the best of all of LA, best Mm -hmm. of both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only question is when they they play football, who do you vote for? The answer is, I don't watch football. (laughs) (laughs) I watch cataract video. (laughs) So UCLA was your first choice, and how was, did it live up to what you expected? Yeah, it's a huge department, and mm-hmm. so you, have a, you can have a, any kind of experience you want there, but it's kind of a program where you get the most out of it if you know what you want and you go chase after that. 
Nothing spoon fed you in that program at all. Mm -hmm. There's no spoon feeding. Mm -hmm. But if you want to achieve something, you're going to, let's say you have an interest in something very specific. There was a brilliant professor at the time. She's still a brilliant professor. Ann Coleman, a glaucoma professor. Ann Coleman was just president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Her research that she did, I thought was fantastic, which was she was analyzing hundreds of thousands of eyes in the Medicare database, which lead me to publish one of the papers I did in, in residency in 99, which was the surgical undertreatment of black beneficiaries of Medicare. So if you look at the rates of glaucoma in the population and the rate of surgery and, and match it, 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 seems like they, it seems like that population had less surgery being done on them, even though they often have glaucoma that's, as you know, more severe. So just her ability to analyze that data, I'd never seen anyone to have that kind of thinking. So she was brilliant. And the other thing I just really loved, so I, I sought her out, did that research, got that paper published. But I also loved that she was such an incredible resident advocate. So the UCLA's residency program, I was the first resident ever to do LASIK in the program in 1998 or so. And why? Because it was because Ann Coleman said, listen, even though I'm a glaucoma doctor, I realize how important it is for you residents to learn LASIK because it's just coming out in 1998. It's fresh. She kind of goes to bat for us against the, the chair, the admin, the whoever, and arranges for us to be able to do LASIK for like, you know, basically only costs, like dirt cheap. So it was amazing that she would go to bat because she wanted the resident to have the best experience, even though it's not even in her specialty. It's not like glaucoma, it's LASIK, for goodness sakes. So just that kind of good-hearted person who's just, it was a huge influence on me. So she was probably, probably one of my favorite faculty members there, and I don't even do glaucoma. Is she still there? She is. She is, and, and um, I hope she's going to be there for a long time. Mm -hmm. She's just fantastic. Did anybody influence you at that stage on, oh, cataract surgery is my preferred the most preferred aspect of ophthalmology that I might pursue later on? Yeah, we had great faculty there. I, that I enjoyed working with Kevin Miller in particular, smart guy, and mm -hmm. really, you know, he started using that star surgical torque lens back when no, no one used a torque mm -hmm. lens, mm -hmm. the plate haptic mm -hmm. silicon ones mm -hmm. in 1990, whatever. Mm -hmm. He had a passion for it, and I really appreciated that. And he was also just, just a generally decent, good person. Mm -hmm. But I think the big factor was... In the first year of residency, in the PGY2 year, I was a little disillusioned, like, gosh, I'm doing clinical day. I, mean, I want to work with my hands more. And as you know, most residencies are kind of top-heavy in terms of surgery. Your, your senior year, you do the most surgery. In your second year, PGY2 year, I mean, you do very little. So I actually started taking these evening classes towards an MBA, like accounting and this. I thought, I don't know if I can just do clinic the rest of my life. I'd better hedge my bets. Until I started doing surgeries like a second year. And I was like, wow, this is just amazing. So I loved surgery from back then. Mm -hmm. And I would, as a resident, I'm not the original godfather of cataract surgery videos. That's Bob Osher. Mm -hmm. Bobby Osher is the godfather of this. I recently took a picture of him at his meeting in Florida last month, put mm -hmm. on my Facebook. Mm -hmm. He is my idol. Mm -hmm. I, he used to make VHS tapes mm -hmm. for a year, once a quarter. Mm -hmm. Showing these beautiful new techniques. Now, your VHS tapes, you had to explain to the young viewers that these plastic boxes that have a tape in it that has video and low def in it. And I would have to hunt around and borrow, beg, and find those videos, those VHS tapes, and I'd watch them over and over and over and over, and over again. I could just, I just couldn't get enough of that. No, he, uh, no, I've seen those videos. I've seen his CD or DVDs. Yeah. And uh, does he still post many videos or no? Um, I'm not sure. He still continues his video journal. Right. I'm not sure the frequency and the total volume that's being done. Yeah. But I don't want to replace that at all. I think it's a brilliant thing. And the way he's done it is fantastic. And he is absolutely, should get all the credit. He's the godfather. Mm -hmm. he has my, he's my idol. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I wanted something different. For me, I wanted, let me just do a new video every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want, it to, I want to make a video that I want to hear mm -hmm. or watch. Mm -hmm. Five minutes, cut to the point. Good commentary. Keep it moving. Mm -hmm. And if the video is too long, but I want to show the whole thing, we're going to watch it at two speed. Because mm -hmm. I look how people, like how, how my, my kids watch YouTube. It's often on 2X just to get things done. Yeah. If you watch videos and you look at the average view time, 
it's usually like if if a video is 20 minutes or whatever or 15 minutes they usually watch about five minutes of it right yeah so you're you're in residency in ophthalmology did you think about hey maybe i should do a fellowship i did and when i first started residency i thought i'd do retina but i realized that the retina doctors often refract their patients with the light switch better on or off <laughs> like wait a minute this is kind of not what i wanted mm -hmm. But those retina surgeons are amazing. They do beautiful, incredible surgeries. But remember, too, at the time, when it was that I was training? Late 90s, finished in 2000 with my residency. There, were, there was no OCT machine. There was no anti-VEGF. They were doing macular translocation surgery for ARMD, which didn't really pan out so well. This is a very different time. And so I just really love the cataract part of it. That was my most favorite part of the whole thing. And at the time, the only fellowship I kind of considered doing would be Doug Cokes in, at uh, Baylor. And Doug is, it's a cornea fellowship, but it's really, really heavy on the IOL side, refractive cataract surgery, essentially. And remember, at the time, in the year 2000, refractive cataract surgery was really a minuscule part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, it's essentially 99 or 98% of the cataracts that are refractive cataract surgery. So it's changed a lot. But I, didn't, I, I, I had a faculty member at the time who left academics. For whatever reason, it wasn't the right fit for him. He moved on. It was Reginald Ariasu. God, I should look his name up. I haven't thought of that name in 20 years. Reggie Ariasu. And I had lunch with him one day when I was a, I don't know, a senior resident. He said, ask yourself. He was a co-resident. No, no, he was a faculty member. Okay. Reg Ariasu was a faculty member at UCLA in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. He, he left afterwards to do some other type of practice. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he, he asked, we had lunch one day, you know, ca sandwich in the cafeteria, and he's saying, ask yourself, what will you get out of the fellowship that you can't do on your own? Now, if you want to do orbital surgery and take out orbital tumors and f decompression for grave surgery, got to do an oculoplastics two-year ASOPERS fellowship. There's no skirting that. If you want to do that combined scleral buckle and vitrectomy for that complex giant retinal tear detachment, you got to do the two-year retina fellowship. There's no, there's, no, there's no skirting this. But if you want to do beautiful cataract surgery, and that's your passion, what are you going to get out of a fellowship? At the time, UCLA's corny fellowship was Two years. There was no femtosecond laser. There was no dual shine flu tomography at the time to even look at the posterior cornea. There was no DSEC, DMEC, no lamellar surgery, period. This is a very, very different time. What would I have gotten out of two years there? Managing corneal ulcers? I don't know if that's exactly what I wanted. So I didn't see how that was going to prepare me for what I want to do. I like LASIK, too. Don't get me wrong. I love doing LASIK. But I really love cataract surgery. But during your residency, you didn't learn much LASIK, right? I was able to do four eyes, which, uh -huh. was, the, which was the first resident to ever do it. And then I obviously learned afterwards on my own. But similarly, listen, you can't be caught up with the idea that you're going to learn some magic in residency or fellowship. There's no magic. Because look what... Look what you did today. I watched you do surgery today. Beautiful cases. None of that existed when you were a resident. The lens you use today didn't exist before then. You got to learn how to do it. The machine didn't exist then. The microscope's even different. The instruments are, everything's different. Everything keeps changing. If I did that corny fellowship, well, I wouldn't have learned any of these things. There were no fake guy wells at the time. There was no femtosecond laser. I couldn't have done smile procedure. I couldn't have done modern day LASIK. There was no wavefront guided, wavefront optimized. There was no, none of it. There were no trackers on the laser, for goodness sakes. You had to hold the eyes still like this. So, so everything you do today, this is a really key lesson. You've, you've learned on your own. The key to being good in ophthalmology is you got to be self-taught and press the pedal down, the accelerator, to keep learning the rest of your career. You absolutely have to. And the, it's, it is so important because our field never changes. I mean, never, uh, never stops changing. It keeps advancing. Newer technologies, new techniques, new everything. The, in fact, you know the guys in the community. There are a couple guys or gals in the community who only do surgery the way they were taught in residency. 
even 20 or 30 years later. And that's a crying shame. So. Yeah, it's the hard part is when you identify people who they don't, they're less motivated to uh, evolve. Yeah. How do you get those people to evolve? I don't know if you can, to be very frank. Mm-hmm. You can lead a horse to water, you can't make her drink, can you? Yeah. So one of the most important questions I used to ask in these residency interviews, in fact, still ask. This is a great one. If you're going to interview at UCLA, this is my favorite question. Tell me something you've taught yourself in the last couple of years outside of medicine. It can be anything. Show me that you can teach yourself something. What have you taught yourself? Some woodworking thing, some craft. I learned to play guitar. Mm-hmm. What did you teach yourself? Mm-hmm. And now with YouTube videos, you can learn a lot. Not just surgery. You can learn how to do any of these things. I want you, I learned how to cook, right? How to really get that steak just perfect, the crust just right, and medium rare in the center. Are YouTube videos, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to teach yourself. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Um, yeah, you can teach yourself so much, but you have to have that. Uh, you have to have that inner drive to do that. Absolutely. And some people just don't have it. And you, uh, at least for me personally, when I see it, I kind of go, ah, that's, they would be so much better if they had that. But how do, it's hard to get people to, I don't know, to, to embrace that. Some people just don't get it. Some well, people do. I want to have the, the, people have their own personalities, but I think the key is finding something about which you're passionate. Mm-hmm. If you're absolutely passionate about a topic, like I'm bananas about cataract surgery, mm-hmm. it's not work. It's just not. I was on vacation mm-hmm. with my kids pre-COVID, and I said, "Oh, it's Monday. I kind of wish I was doing surgery." And they're like, "What? We come all the way over here. We're in Singapore. Our next trip, next next stop is Bali." And you're worried about, like, you're not doing enough surgery? I'm like, no, I just like doing surgery. It's just fun. It's like, it's like the world's best video game that even 20,000 surgeries later, I still love it. It's fun. It is fun. Um, so then you're, you're finishing up with residency. You're choosing that you probably don't want to do a fellowship. So... Uh, where are you looking, what are you looking to do and where are you looking to live? Are you looking to leave LA, stay in LA for a, a job? What kind of, so there are a lot of residents out there who are going to look for a job. And how did you, how did you go about that? Well, always keep in mind that your first job is kind of like your first girlfriend or first boyfriend. Maybe good for now, but may not be the one you're going to be with forever. And that's Okay. So when you get that acceptance, like, all right, this is a path that I'm on. I don't mind if, you know, okay, let's let's, let's see how this goes. If it's just not the right fit, I can change gears. I'm still early in my path. That's okay. And the other thing is, I'm not afraid of competition. I tell some of these young doctors, these young residents, you've been top 1% your whole life. You were top 1% in high school, top 1% in college, top 1% in med school. You're top of the curve here in residency. Are you ready now for the bottom half of the bell curve? No. It's not who you are. So I don't care how many doctors are around me, how many ophthalmologists in your neighborhood. Don't matter to me. I'm there. I'm going to practice where I want, regardless of what the competition is. So you... It's not about the competition. It's about me. It comes from within. And so, so where did you end up choosing to work after you finished your ophthalmology residency? A couple different things. Mm-hmm. You know, I get, it, my career wasn't like set from the beginning it's kept it's evolved in fact it's it still evolves now even i've had a change in the last month or two even mm-hmm. so things keep evolving mm-hmm. so initially i want i know i want to do some solo stuff so i shared space with someone else locally on the west side of la mm-hmm. and just paid him a percent of the of the revenue i generated as overhead that mm-hmm. way if i didn't generate much i didn't have to pay much mm-hmm. and he was happy if i generated more i'd pay more mm-hmm. It's also how I came about to be, record all my surgeries. How do we, why do you video record surgeries? Or most or some of them. I don't record necessarily all of them. But Well, when I started and I was practicing in that same hospital that was, you know, 
biased against my own dad. Another fellow off the Muslim community complained that I couldn't possibly be doing good surgery because I was doing a cataract in 10 minutes or less. So maybe I was doing sham surgery. It wasn't a good surgery. That was the accusation. Another ophthalmologist said Yeah, this? an older guy. Uh-huh. Older guy who honestly didn't have much skill. Who was So I, I had rigged up a camcorder, this like handheld camera that had like DV tapes in it to the assistant scope and I had to custom make some kind of adapter to it. And I'd video record all the surgeries. Then I'd use a fire wire cable. Wow, this is old. To input it into my computer, which is some, you know, old computer at the time. And then I'd render that as an MPEG-1 file in standard def, which is like, what, 640 by 480. And it was so slow, it'd render one frame a second. So just to render that six or eight minute video, had to, the computer had to run the whole night. But the nice, fortuitous part of that was, now I can probably prove that here, every case I did, it's a beautiful surgery. There's a video, you can watch it. I also complained that you may want to look into the other guy. If he's taking 45 minutes to an hour to do one cataract, he's probably incompetent. Mm -hmm. They ignored me. Mm -hmm. But now here's the best part. When I started to speak at meetings, I had video. No one else had video. Mm -hmm. I don't have to show you a VHS tip. I can have a video built into my PowerPoint talk in 2002. So you finished residency what year? 2000. 2000. And the first ASC I think it was 2003 that I went to in San Francisco as a, as a, as a, where I'm giving a lecture and showing a video. And I had incorporated into my PowerPoint an MPEG-1 video file. And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And people are now like, wow, you can show a video of surgery that's tougher to do without like tapes and all the nonsense. It's built into his PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And I've since evolved that now. Mm -hmm. Now you know what I do for my presentations? Like, you will be on my panel, mm -hmm. the, the Millennial Eye, this Saturday, a Millennial mm -hmm. Eye meeting here in Austin. Mm -hmm. No PowerPoint. We have a 60-minute session. I submitted a video file, an MPEG-4, in high def, 1920, 1080. Mm -hmm. That's exactly 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Mm -hmm. So we get on the podium, I just say, play. Mm -hmm. I will not be one second <laughs> over your time. So if you're one of those speakers, let me look at the camera here. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those speakers who goes up on the podium and it shows the PowerPoint and goes on the clicker, yang, 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 next slide and this, and reading your slide, stop, stop. Make it fun. Make it quick. Make it a single MPEG video file. That's the future. And even one step beyond, like when I spoke at Hawaii and I in January, my Monday talk on the podium was like seven minutes about white cataracts. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what the cataract coach video of the day was? That same talk. Mm -hmm. So I talked live at Hawaii while the video played, mm -hmm. whereas on cataract coach, I already had a voiceover track. Mm -hmm. And so when I give the talk and the podium, say, hey, if you liked my talk, it's already on your phone. Now, do you mind sharing how, how you actually make your videos? Do you do them daily? Do you do them uh, on weekends? When do you find the time to do your videos? Great question. And here's what people may not understand. A five-minute video at a bare minimum, an hour of labor, probably two or three or four or five. It's a, it's a lot. A video a day is no joke. Try one. <laughs> Record one of your cases. Edit it down. You've done this many times. Do a voiceover. Do a title slide. Upload it. Write a description. It's a ton of work. So I can't do one every day. I have a cue. So like this month is already done. I don't want to do any videos for this month. They're already going to post automatically. They post at 6 a.m. East Coast time, which is, I think, um, 5 a.m. here and 3 a.m. in Los Angeles. And I do that so that all my, my East Coast fans on their way to work get a new video every day. But it's a ton of work. So I do them in batches. I'll sit there and I try to do a week at a time. Sometimes I'll do two weeks at a time. If I'm really just like a couple of shots of espresso in and I got a weekend where I'm kind of bored or the weather's crummy and I can't ride my mountain bike, I'll do, a, I'll do four weeks at a time, one, one, one day or one weekend. Just mm -hmm. crank through it. Yeah, video editing is, you, you don't have a team, do you? Yeah, I got me and myself and I. I mean, that's, a, that's my whole team. It's a, it's but a, here's the problem. Yeah. You can't outsource it. Right. If I get a video editor who's a fantastic video editor, smarter than me, been doing it using the professional avid editing system, whatever. 
How do I show it to this person? Here's a 45 minute complex surgery. Can you break it down and just the highlights and show me, make it into six minutes? He has no idea what's important. It's like asking a ballerina to show you what's the important parts of the football plays. How do you make a highlight reel if you don't know the sport? But just thinking out loud, that might be the path to you're making even more impactful videos going forward. That might be a position you hire for in the future because it frees you up to do other things. And they, they become, I mean, these YouTubers can learn. They hire a team to help them with production. And so that's how they're able to produce these super high quality videos and it elevates their game. So that might actually be something that you could, you could mentor people for residents or whatever. You could. Uh The, 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 there's a podcast that I'm sure you heard too, but for Mr. Beast. Yes. I listened to the whole thing. Now, Mr. Beast is not like you or me, where we're just regular people. He's the number one YouTuber in terms of views for the last couple of years. Crazy numbers, billions of views. He was such a down to earth, decent guy on the podcast. I loved to listen to him. And he kind of gave away a lot of his, his important points. And he has a team of 100 people working for him. It's a humongous business. Now, the catch with us is, first, we're a little bit more limited in that scope. The, the, the audience to watch a really amazing, cute puppy video is pretty huge. To watch someone suck out a cataract? Yeah, smaller audience. Smaller. So I don't know if we're going to do that same thing. But again, the catch here too is in terms of the editing, I can definitely spruce it up a little bit. Of back. I do an intro no- sound now, but maybe, and I have a kind of dedicated look. I have a logo. My title slides have the same font, always same coloring. There's this consistency to it. Yeah, could I have like some more music in it, some higher production value? I could. And I think that'll help. And that's a good idea. But still, at the end of the day, I can't teach a non-ophthalmologist what's critically important about surgery. Because as I edit the video, I'm kind of creating a voiceover track in my head. Like, oh, let me show this. I only want to show that quick. I want to show that extra pair, but let me just show it in one second. And then this section, uh, let me just cut to, let me do that at 4x speed, and this I'll slow back down. And then I'm like, let me just delete that one part, cut that out. And when I edit, I'm kind of already doing a voiceover track in my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I finally get the edit done, I can do the voiceover. Mm -hmm. So one thing you could do is upgrade to these latest generation. uh, I don't know if you use a Mac or whatever, um, but like the latest generation Macs, their processing times, their rendering times are much faster. And so that might save like a lot of time. Although I'll tell you, even if I batch, let's say I do 14 videos in a day. I just hit render when I go to bed. Oh, yeah. In the morning, it's all rendered. It's mm-hmm. all done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, that's not really... The, the big issue is really at cutting down a long video to a short video and deciding what to say on the track. Yeah, on that's the voiceover true. track. Yeah. And I try to do different styles of videos. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of my videos that I show me operating, I'll, I'll call it a complete cataract case. And I'll show you the entire case from the first incision to I'm done. Usually at, at normal 1x speed. If it's a tough case and I want to show you the whole thing, maybe I'll show it 2x speed. Nice part there, they don't have to do any editing because I'm just going to show the entire video. Mm. But I got to say, do a voiceover track that's going to keep you entertained and not just like, here's me making a paracentesis. Here's me making it. It's got to have some entertainment value. Yeah. And so that there's a balance there as well. In fact, I, I realized that I have these sayings. I, I met someone, one, a young fan at one of these meetings I was at, and he's like, oh, yeah, do you know I hear my top favorite cataract coach sayings. And I was like, ooh, great idea for video. So I made a video once of the top five cataract coach sayings. So I tend to say things over and over again. Right. Like, this scholastic is cheaper than vitreous. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> if, if, you, if it does not spin. You will not win. That's correct. Exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're working, and then I, let me think back. It was... I guess around 2005, that's, I think that's when I first met you. You may not remember, but I think it was back in the Krista lens days. Yeah. Um, maybe you were at a meeting in Dallas or something like that. Um, 
And you know, you, I think you, the meeting you, was even here because I remember playing Barton Hills is here, right? Yeah, you've been to Austin before, yeah. but this was this was like early on, two thousand four, two thousand five okay. era. Um, and you were you were two thousand four, so you were early thirties, sure. And you were you were pretty visible as a, a speaker for a speaker. Sure, I'm not a I'm not a speaker for anybody, so I don't really know that world, but. You were very visible. Did you, did, how, why did you want to do that? And what was your goal? I always loved teaching. That was always a fun thing to do and to kind of share experiences. And I love to meet colleagues. Like I get so much out of just coming here, watching someone else operate, to see the little things that you do in the operating room, kind of pick up some pearls. I think that's super valuable. So I always loved interacting with fellow colleagues because to me it's a way of learning, also teaching. But it's a two-way street. I'm not just giving info. I'm getting info. I wanted to do that. I liked that. I did a lot of that consulting, podium stuff, traveling, lecturing, live surgery. Probably my favorite thing to do is live surgery events. For many, many years. Then I actually took off about six years of zero traveling, zero meetings. You know, so it was like an absence of me from maybe 2012, 13 to maybe 2019. Just absence, even before COVID. In fact, my first meeting back, I remember I took all these years off. Most of you spent it with my kids because I wasn't seeing my kids. But I, I had a realization. That realization was one of those years of doing all this traveling and lecturing and speaking. It was so much. I said, wow, look, I just got Hilton Diamond status. I was like, woo, yeah, Diamond. Until I read the fine print, it said, oh, because you spent 63 nights in our hotels last year. And I was like, What? I spent two months of last year in these hotels. Like, what am I doing? And mind you, you're, you're, third, you're in your 30s, you're young, energetic. I'm like, finish surgeries, fly out, do some lectures, fly back home, do more surgery, see more clinic, crank, 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 crank. I'd even like, if I had to miss too much of a week, I'd work Saturdays and see patients. I really kind of burn the candle at both ends. But there's end up, ends, up being, ends up being a balance in life. I'm not always doing things the right way. I learned kind of the hard way. I learned by kind of making mistakes and recovering from them. And one of those was, yeah, at one point I was doing way, way, way too much traveling. So if you, if you had to go back and it's, I don't know, 2003, and you're, you know now what you didn't know then, would you have changed how you went about things at that point? I, I tend not to go back and do the would have, could have, should have. Uh -huh. Because whatever it was got me here. And mm -hmm. I love being here in the now. Whatever's happened now, mm -hmm. best thing in my life. Mm -hmm. What would you advise for somebody who is in their first five years of training? They're highly ambitious and they want to be very um, well known. Do great work. And try your best to give the talk or the lecture that you'd want to receive. That's the magic of it. So if you're sitting in the audience, what would you want to see on the podium? Mm -hmm. Give that talk. Because mm -hmm. that's what everyone else in the audience wants too. Mm -hmm. There is a path to the podium. And in fact, I encourage, if you are a young ophthalmologist, in your 30s, maybe early 40s, please get into this. There's almost an absence. There's a lot of ophthalmologists my age, 50-ish, and 60s and 70s who are always on the podium, et cetera. There's a lot fewer of the younger generations, 30s, 40s. Definitely, if this is something you want to do, pursue it. But do it on your terms. Meaning, doing it on your terms means what's the balance that's right for your life? And it may be different for different people. You may want to travel more and you don't mind that. Maybe you want to travel a little bit less. Maybe you want to do more virtual things. Maybe you want to do more in person. Large group, small group. Live surgery is kind of not so popular anymore, but that used to be a huge thing. And that's a challenge. Some people don't know. Live surgery is when I'm doing a cataract surgery on a real live patient in an operating room. And it's being transmitted live via the internet or whatever, or the old day satellite. And I got two earpieces. I'm operating with the microscope camera, but also two other side cameras. There's a director in one earpiece telling you, Move your left hand, I can't see. 
So in fact, I wouldn't even hold the chopper that way. I'd have to hold the chopper this way so the camera could get a good view of the eye. The other earpiece is the, the moderator of the audience, the, uh, another Othmar is saying, oh, tell me about this incision you're making now. What are you doing there? You got to do this surgery. And a thousand people are watching you. Um, 500 ophthalmologists are watching you. And while everyone wants the patient to do well, when you watch a car race, you wouldn't mind seeing a wreck or two as long as no one gets hurt. And so same with this, they don't mind seeing a fumble or two. So it's really, it's tough to be able to talk and operate, hear two different hear pieces, and then have that pressure to be able to do the case. But that's, that was fun. I love life surgery. It's pr high pressure. Yeah, it is, but it's just, it's fun. So do, are they going to bring that back? I'm not sure. Because um, COVID kind of shut things down. Yeah, so. I think mm -hmm. if they do it for the U.S. meetings, I think it's valuable. It's just a valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. To see someone live, there's a lot more you learn from a cherry pick video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love but that. if you want to be on the podium, listen, mm -hmm. you should do it. Follow your heart. Follow what's right for you. And just go, go, go. Just do it. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. Keep at it. The hardest part of all, though, as you know, is content creation. If it takes you a couple of hours to make a one video, to make a presentation... The talk we're doing, my presentation for this, this Saturday, one hour long, it took me umpteen hours. I don't know. It took me forever. Started off writing some notes on the back of an envelope. <laughs> Next thing you know, the other side of the envelope too. Next thing you know, I'm putting together various videos, and then it's too long, and i got to cut it down, and what's the right... You know, it's a ton of work to make a great presentation. An hour-long, <coughs> curated, edited video... And you're using videos that you've used in the past. Correct. Right? So you have to add that time in there. It, yeah. Could yeah. be hundreds of hours. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a wide range. But it can be a lot of hours. Yeah. But the nice part is, too, though, now that I have Cataract Coach with 1,400 plus videos mm -hmm. and growing, mm -hmm. I can think of any topic like brunescent cataract. I already got 40 or 50 videos. I can show you. Mm -hmm. And I'll take snippets of each, like the good parts of each. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now it's nice I have a library that I own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very good, very useful. I even have a library of, of photos. So now I do is I have any good ophthalmology photo I end up saving with a really good descriptor. Like white cataract, tripan stained, Rexus run out, Argentina flag, whatever it is. So now I can like go to my folder of ophthalmic pictures, surgical pictures, and I can type in a topic like, you know, Argentina flag sign. And those are, here come 10 or 12 or 15 original pictures, mm -hmm. no copyright issues, mm -hmm. done. So I can write an article or, or do some post online and there's the picture, done. Mm -hmm. It's very useful. I, I mean, I watch your stuff and I, I would imagine uh, it's most valuable for some, I, I personally find it valuable, but I would imagine somebody who's 20 to 30 years younger than me would find it even more valuable than than I would. I mean, the proof's in the growth. It's mm -hmm. grown. The volume of, of, of views has grown every month, mm -hmm. kind of nonstop for the last yeah, few years. Yeah, that's a, that's a part of the seductive nature of YouTube. You can actually track everything, quantify everything, so you can kind of assess, hey, what works, what doesn't work? Right. Am I growing? Um, who's watching? How much time do they watch? Uh, it's very interesting. Well, but, you know, in addition to the YouTube, I actually post them also on my, there's a physical website. There's a cataractcoach.com mm -hmm. that actually is a website that's actually easier to search than just the YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And I link the YouTube videos in those, but those often have text and figures that you won't find on the YouTube channel. Do you get more traffic going to Cataract Coach or do you get more traffic going directly from YouTube? It's a pretty even split. So I have 37,000 YouTube subscribers. I've got about 5,000-ish email subscribers that subscribe to my daily email. What do they get from that? Oh, it's the same video. There's a link to it. But in addition, there's text, picture, etc. Oh, they get an email notification. Every morning. I got it. See, I'm not a Cataract Coach subscriber, or I don't, I don't know if you're, that's you're, what you call it. You're a YouTube subscriber, I'm but YouTube not a website subscriber. That's right. Okay, got it. You're missing out on some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because you know, I have other I have other kind of horses in the game. Like, for example, I write a column or have for almost two hundred months in a row for Ocular Surgery News. I've been writing my back to basics column, which is purely teaching you kind of like the basics of modern day ocular surgery, mm -hmm. all aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I've been writing that monthly for sixteen coming on seventeen years. Mm -hmm. What well, do they ask you to write about? 
whatever I want. It's whatever I want. I make the topics. Mm-hmm. But I also use that similar text or almost the same text in the post of that nature. If I, let's have a tough cataract case that I want to kind of show you a game play by play of how I did it. I'll take mm-hmm. three screenshots for the in press written article, but I'll get all that thousand words of text that I just wrote and put it in that post that's on cataractcoach.com or in the email that you get. Mm-hmm. It's not in the YouTube description. Mm-hmm. 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 You can't add different fonts, different things. You can't add pictures into the YouTube description. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. simply ASCII text. So you, you, you've you taught a lot of residents. Um, what's that like? How is that teaching residents? Is it is it stressful? Is it fun? Is it... Um, I mean, what's that like? I, I have not taught residents, so I, I really don't know. It, it's all the above. Mm-hmm. I mean, for if you, if you did residency at UCLA in the last 20-ish years, chances are 90-plus percent accuracy that you did your first FACO ever with me, mm-hmm. including me holding your hands, <laughs> rescuing you. The tough part there is, as you know, cataract surgery is an unforgiving surgery. You burn that cornea. Puncture the lens capsule. You run out that rexus. You let vitreous prolapse. You can't undo it. It's done. So to rescue a case or prevent it from... It's kind of like teaching driver's ed. Where you need to be prepared to grab that steering wheel at any time just to make sure you don't crash. There is some stress in that for sure. But it's something I've done so often in so many years. It's very easy and natural to me. So I'm, a, I'm able to teach the residents. And... The goal, obviously, is that you're toward the end of your residency. I don't even have to do anything. I can just sit there and watch, and you can do a beautiful case. But remember this, too. What's the, as you know, tens of thousands of cases in your career? The, the, in residency, you may do 200, 300 cases, and you think you're far up the learning curve. But 500 cases is, at best, halfway up the learning curve. There's so much more to be learned. Yeah, I, it's, I would say it's eternally humbling. Because even, I think, until you retire, you're, Murphy always shows up. And there's always a situation where you go, oh. But yeah. I think as you get older and more experienced, hopefully, um, you learn how to manage that situation um, without kind of losing your composure or for sure getting emotional about it. And you actually become... Very good at like identifying things really quickly. And so you can stop and just make an adjustment and you can manage a situation that maybe five, 10, 20 years ago, you may not have recognized it until, you know, a few seconds. You, you recognize it two mm-hmm. seconds after you did right. now. And it, it's a total game changer. It's very interesting, but it's always humbling. And like I was telling our, we, we train our uh, scrub techs in the operating room. I said, you're getting good. I said to one of our newer scrub techs, I said, you're getting good. But always just be prepared because you never it, know. It's not going to go perfect every time. Yeah, you know, character takes years to learn, but a lifetime to master yeah. is the tough part. But here's the neatest thing about cataract coach. Here's what I think is the most valuable aspect of the entire cataract coach. It compresses the learning curve. You can see a complication on video, see it happen. I'll play it back in slow motion, understand the physics of why it happened, how to recover from it. And you can do that before you ever encounter it. So that learning curve is compressed now. So I'll give you a good example. We're going to preview. It's going to be on our Saturday video. I posted a video of a phaco tip that was clogged with viscoelastic. And this anonymous video that was sent into cataract coach, the surgeon's operating, and you see a white cloud of lens material that just kind of stays at the tip as he gives ultrasonic energy. And as you look carefully, you'll see, because it's blocked and the heat that's created from the ultrasound energy, the BSS boils through the phaco sleeve. And of course it burns the cornea. I post this video Six, eight weeks later, a resident in the U.S. sends me a video. Hey, I saw that video of the wound burn. And I was in the operating room today, and look what happened. He says, I started the case, and there's a little plume of white spoke. I stopped. I came out of the eye. 
And lo and behold, the phaco tip was clogged with scholastic. I cleared it, proceeded with the case normally, beautiful outcome. He said, watching your video prevented me from that complication, saved my patient's vision. And I was like, wow, that's the proof. You now compress the learning curve. He didn't have to suffer the complication on his own. He could see it, learn it, understand it. So when that does happen to you, now you can deal with it. And that is probably the most important thing a cataract coach. If you are, if you're a 30 to 50 year old surgeon in practice, you know what I do in cataract coach? I give away every, absolutely every secret and pearl that I've ever learned in cataract surgery. I'm giving it all away. Just watch. It's free. <laughs> so what do you think the young ophthalmologist today, because you, you've taught a lot of residents and you've seen kind of the, their mindset over decades, I guess. Um, what are they looking for these days? What's compared to maybe when, when you and I came out? Um, or what should they be looking forward to? What, what's kind of, what kind of environment, what kind of world are they walking into um, that, that we have today? And, and how did it differ maybe back when you came out? It's a great question. I think in, in one sense, they want the same thing we'd want it to, which is we want to enjoy our craft, enjoy helping people, not only making the blind see, restoring vision in our patients. There's, there is such a pleasure in that. So they want that same thing. They want to master their craft and help a ton of patients and really enjoy it, the process. But some of the things that are more challenging, you know, the feet cuts are going big time. I was talking to an older ophthalmologist this, this week, and he said that in 1980, when he started practice, he was getting $2,600 a cataract in $1980, which is like, what, like five grand a cataract now? More? In the year This is from insurance. From Medicare. Mm -hmm. From Medicare, from your insurance paying this. Huge. Then in the year 2000-ish, when I finished, it was maybe $1,000, $1,100 for a cataract. Now we're like 500 and change. And obviously with, with, with inflation, mm -hmm. this makes it really odd. It's a, so they're, the younger generation is facing these increased challenges in terms of that. And one of the things maybe we're not doing a great job at is kind of standing up for ourselves. I always think that the poor retina surgeons, when, you know, when, they're, when, when Medicare's paying 2000 or so for an injection of an anti-VEGF medicine, 95% of the money is going to the drug company. 5% goes to the surgeon who does all the work and takes all the liability. Really? Really? Does that really make sense? I mean, there was a poster at the Academy about one of these companies, and they said, hey, we've done 16 million injections. And I was like, I'm good at math. Remember I was on the math team? That's $30 billion. $30 billion. I'm like, Okay. Glad you pointed that out for us. <laughs> but what's the limit? How much? I don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. So that's a big challenge for them. Another one I think people have realized, not just in ophthalmology, I think in, not just in medicine even, across all work. There's got to be some balance in life. Ask an ophthalmologist who's a generation older than you. Now, at your life, at age... 75, 80, whatever. What's most important to you? It's time. Health and time. So I think we need to prioritize health and happiness, time to, avail, to spend with people you love, to have relationships. You ever do this? You ever add? And then work is important too, but maybe it's not the number one thing. Maybe if I'm, if I'm you know, on my deathbed five minutes from dying at age 117, uh, maybe I won't say, I wish I did one more FACO. <laughs> Right? Uh -huh. They have done enough. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance there. As, as we alluded to earlier, the importance of kind of changing gears throughout your life and figuring mm -hmm. out, okay, what's important now? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do the same thing forever. Mm -hmm. But if you ever ask your patients who are 90 plus, I, always, I love the nonagenarians. First, nonagenarians. There's a whole section on cataract coach about cataract surgery and nonagenarians because it's totally different. Mm -hmm. That aging from 80 to 90 is no simple thing. It changes a lot. Mm -hmm. But you ask the nonagenarians, in your life, teach me some of your wisdom. I love to ask this question when someone's 90 plus. What's been the most important thing in your life? 
they all say the same thing. The relationships, family, with friends, with good people, the good times they tell you about. They talk about experiences mm-hmm. and relationships. Mm-hmm. They never talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. They never talk about working more. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, that's what's most important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was just like last week I was operating on this lady. She's born 1930. Wow. And so I'm just talking to her during surgery because our patients are awake and they're comfortable and they're numb and everything. But uh, I go, do you remember World War II? And she's just telling me about, she lived in London. She goes, I remember we were being bombed. Wow. And so they have this, you're talking to these people who lived history. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Um. So what do you do in your free time? I love a lot of things. I love, obviously, enjoying those relationships. Family, friends are super important to me. I really enjoy certain, certain exercises. I don't like running. I don't like jogging. But I, I, love, I love weightlifting. I love the weightlift. <laughs> I love that. It's just fun to do. Mm-hmm. Gets all the stress out. Mm-hmm. I have picked up a few months ago mountain bike riding. Mm-hmm. I'm really not good at it. Mm-hmm. But boy, do I love it. Going downhill on a bicycle is the closest thing I know to feeling like I'm 10 years old again. Mm-hmm. When I go downhill on that bike, I literally say, woohoo! Now, it's so much fun. But what about going uphill, Uday? I crank. I don't use an electric bike either. No assist. I have much less than one horsepower in my legs, and that's what I use. Crank it up that hill. Thank, thank goodness for the, low ge- the, easy, the easy gear and the grandpa gears. That's where you get the workout is the uphill. But that's the, the reward for the uphill is the downhill. <laughs> so, no, I, I love riding the bike. I uh-huh. love that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. I love to travel, too, and give mm-hmm. these talks. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm here for the Millennial Eye meeting. We're going to give some fun lectures, network with the whole generation of these younger ophthalmologists. Mm-hmm. But importantly, I get to come spend time with you, mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. cultivate those important relationships and mm-hmm. friendships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, and also to learn. I'm here to learn. This is pu- I'm seriously here to learn. Mm-hmm. You change the way I approach... RK patients. Mm-hmm. I used to have a mindset of like, no, if you have a radial keratotomy, you, can't, you can only have a monofocal lens. Maybe monofocal torque, but monofocal. I saw some of your videos putting an EDOF lens in. I'm like, wait a minute. Let me try this. I'm like, well, by be gosh. I'll be, I'll be darn it. Mm-hmm. He's right, by mm-hmm. golly. Mm-hmm. So now you've changed my... So I learned by watching your videos, by talking to you, come visiting you. It all is part of my learning. No, we're all learning from one another. So the genesis of that, I'll tell you, we're walking around. I guess it's uh, whenever the symphony lens came out. Maybe it's 2016, okay. 2017. And I'm walking uh, in, a, in one of the meetings, national meetings. And Stephen Dell told me that he put symphony lenses in RK patients. And I go, really? Okay, I'll, I'll try it. So I did it. And then I did it over and over, and we had great results. So when the Vividi came out, I go, oh, let's Just give it a shot. principle, just less halos. Let's do that. So, yeah, we learn from one another. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. I, uh, listen, I listened to a podcast that Stephen Dell did with Peter Atia. And the nice this podcast is interesting because Peter Atia is a brilliant physician and surgeon. He's not an ophthalmologist. But he went to Stanford Medical School. The guy's truly brilliant. But it just shows you, even a brilliant physician, how little exposure to ophthalmology they've had. And Stephen Dell did a fantastic job of explaining, in three hours, kind of everything ophthalmology, all the million questions that all people ask you at a cocktail party, to, to Peter Tia, in like plain English with such great analogies. I listened to the whole podcast, even at, just to pick up the pearls of like, how do you explain things? Like LASIK versus Pierre K, and the example that Steve Dell gave was like a book. LASIK, you lift the cover of the book, take out a few pages, put the cover down. Pure K, you got to take the cover off, get rid of it. Take a few pages out and let the cover grow back. Like, wow, that's brilliant. Or cataracts like an M&M. Love it. So I learned a lot by listening to a podcast that was not intended for ophthalmologists. No, and I think it's really good if, if ophthalmologists share their information because there's more than enough to go around. Sure. And it just benefits everybody if you share what you learn. Um, don't... Uh, kind of withhold information thinking uh, that somehow you're, you'll keep an advantage over somebody else. Just share it. It's, there's more than enough to go around. Truly 100%. In fact, the, the, 
Cadillac's already expected to grow in the U.S. over the next 10 years substantially. Substantially. So speaking of that, what are the next, where do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? It's always hard to predict the future. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of better at adapting to the future than predicting it. Mm-hmm. But certainly I can't ever see myself stopping doing surgery. Mm-hmm. Maybe at some point where I'm not capable of doing a beautiful surgery. And I'd hopefully at that point have my partners tell me, hey, hey doc, you're okay, but uh, maybe specialize in PRK from now on. <laughs> <laughs> ophthalmology joke. If you're not an ophthalmology, you won't quite get that. But, but I think that it's important. I think I'll continue to do cataract surgery. I mm-hmm. certainly have a passion for cataract coaching. That's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. In fact, I want to grow that into a dedicated presence at a meeting, a cataract coach section, mm-hmm. like we're doing it this weekend, plus the videos every day, plus I have my column that I write, maybe kind of rebrand that for back to basics, maybe that a cataract coach column, and just kind of do various things all in that regard, kind of off, just ophthalmic surgical education. Mm-hmm. I think we can raise the, 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 the bar for everyone. Everyone can do better surgery. We share what we do and we'll all become better surgeons and the patient will benefit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think in that regard, I think as you as an ophthalmologist, your, your loyalty is number one should be to your patients. Mm-hmm. Number two is loyal to your, your staff, yourself, your, your practice, of course. And then lastly, loyal to any one company. Don't be in love with one company who makes ophthalmic products. Like them all. Mm-hmm. Get all the tools in your toolbox. Don't just get one company's tools. Mm-hmm. Get all the tools. And then you decide for every patient what would be the best for that patient out of all the tools. So I'm always a fan of having more options in the toolbox rather than less options. Do you think a majority of ophthalmologists use m- multiple companies or do you think a majority of ophthalmologists are convinced for various reasons to gravitate and have loyalty to one company. I think the ophthalmologists are smart. They, they're loyal to their patients and their own practice uh-huh. and their own clinic and their staff. Uh-huh. I think that you may have a fastball that you like, like your favorite pitch. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, what's my fastball? What's my... No-? Hey, perfectly fine. And that changes over the time, too. Mm-hmm. Like I saw I use the lens today, that three-piece lens, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the zero, zero sphere garbage. I've done thousands of those. Mm-hmm. Not using them commonly now, but so maybe I've changed over, over the years. Mm-hmm. But I'll go through phases, and uh, but I, I don't want to exclude anything. Mm-hmm. I want to have every available option. Mm-hmm. So for the or any ophthalmologist at any age, my question was going to be for the younger ophthalmologist. But what's what's your prediction for medicine, healthcare, ophthalmology, cataract surgery over the next five years? I think cataract surgical volume is going to grow more and more. Mm-hmm. And as we get better and better technology IOLs, we'll be able to restore more natural, more youthful vision. And whether that's coming out with these extended depth of focus lenses, which I think are a little bit of a game changer here, that's really given us a lot of the increased range with not a lot of downsides. That's good. I think you're certainly going to see accommodating IOLs come. Now, I have a financial interest in the lens gen, Juvene lens, but there are others as well. And I think it's only a question of time before you have a truly accommodating IOL. And the results are pretty spectacular. I, I have an early experience. I've put in the first lens gen Juvene lenses in 2015 in Panama, outside the U.S. That's seven years ago. And the results are pretty darn good. And now that's in an FDA trial. And there are other horses in that same race. All have all pretty good products. Mm-hmm. So I think it's only a question of time before we have a truly accommodating IOL. And that's going to be a big game changer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I think as the technology keeps getting better, uh, it'll open the, the pool of uh, patients who can benefit from it. For sure. Um, yeah. So like, let's say <coughs> a patient today doesn't want to, they want to have everything, so they want to have full range of focus and no halo. I mean, that would be a, a game changer. Yeah. But we don't have that yet. We don't. So now when they tell me what they want, I want to see like I was 20 years old and I said, yeah, and I want to feel like I was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but both of us are out of luck. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you give to a college student who's considering a career in medicine today? Shadow a little bit. Make sure you love this. Make sure you like it. And there's so many different aspects of it you can do. But make sure it's the right thing for you. But if you have that inclination, go for it. Don't let anyone hold you back. Mm-hmm. Pursue your dreams. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Definitely have that drive and determination and, and pursue what you want. Mm-hmm. 
Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So it's, you know, most of these things, listen, most of the success is about the, your attitude mm-hmm. and how hard you work, right? It's not, it's not about luck. Or if you want to think it's luck, I always say the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So it's about hard work. And as you know, you know, one of my favorite videos of yours is the day in the life video. I really loved your video. In fact, I called you, I think, the day I saw it. Mm-hmm. You posted it maybe a day, or, a day later I watched it, and I was like, wow, blown away. That's a very realistic video. Mm-hmm. Because from the outside, you may see that, oh, it looks pretty easy. You just mm-hmm. kind of show up in the morning, and you said hi to people. You had your coffee. You knocked out a bunch of cataracts. And now you're done for the day. What an easy, good life. Oh, no, no. That five-minute surgery took you, each one took hours of preparation. Mm-hmm. That's sometimes not quite understood. Yeah. And we walked over here and I saw John Odette mm-hmm. doing Torah calculations on his, on his computer. Mm-hmm. That's what it involves. Mm-hmm. You're sitting here, you're sweating all the little details. And so it's not just the glamour part of like, oh, what a beautiful surgery, pow, in and out, done, next, next. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. It's all the work involved. Day in the life. If, you want to cons- if you're a college student and you say, well, or med student, I want to do ophthalmology. Watch Shannon's Day in the Life video. Link will be ding there or there somewhere. (laughs) But it's important because that tells you it's a real, it's like you and I, we both wake up super early. Like on Monday, I'll be up at four in the morning. I'll be in the surgery center at 5.15. My character coach viewers know I often shoot like philosophical type videos and kind of life lessons on my phone. And you see the clock in the background at 5.15 in the morning in my surgery center. That's how early it is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of an anti-social media person um, because I become over time kind of jaded by all these photos of people with filters and saying I'm so honored or so blessed and it's just a glamorized version of whatever they're doing yeah and I, I've kind of the, the purpose behind that video was really to, to show it's nothing's easy yeah it's it's not the quick Instagram picture of of me, uh, whatever, doing doing something and, and making it look perfect. It's just it's a lot of work Correct. every day for a lifetime. Of course, but I mean, if you if you're able to do that and you think about it and you plan, you just make. Make that effort every day over a lifetime. It it does, hopefully, if you're fortunate and have a lot of work. And what do they say? Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. You know, sure. you can you can do a lot. Um, so I mean, the it, amount of work required for all these things is so intense. I came to your beautiful clinic here today, gorgeous facility, and then I thought, this must have been ten thousand hours of work yeah it took, just from you from you alone yeah it took a lot because i mean i don't think anybody here except my wife who helped uh, help us build it understands but it's just it took years i mean so we bought this property in 2017 and we didn't start construction until 2020 yeah, we had to have lawyers, accountants, engineers, architects, general contractors. Uh, it, it, it's it's a, but as part of that process is you realize um, it, it's good to be able to do something that others are maybe unwilling or uh, yeah unwilling or unmotivated to do because it makes it extra special. Yeah, because sure. you go, oh wow, you've, you know, you've, you've done something that's it's like climbing climbing Mount Everest or something. The reason why it's it's kind of recognized as a is most people are unwilling to do that or unable to do that. Right. So, um, yeah, it's it's we're glad we're here, but it, it took literally five years. Yeah, I mean, not easy. Countless thousands and thousands of hours. even the little details here. Like I liked outside your doors in the exam rooms, the little glass panel that looks so pretty, but oh no, you can actually write on it with a, a dry erase pen and it's magnetic to stick something on. Yeah, so 
That's genius. That's like a culmination of so many things. We visited so many practices. Like we visited a practice in Dallas. They had iPads outside the door. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. In that same practice, they had whiteboards everywhere. And then we had visited another practice in South Dakota. And they had whiteboards all over the place. I go, that's really good, whiteboards. And then we got whiteboards at one of our older offices that are now closed. But then I realized, oh, there's something called a glass board. Yeah, pretty. And I go, that's nicer. And I go, oh, and, and if you could, well, how would you hang a uh, hang something from a glass board? Well, then you find out that they actually make magnetic glass boards. So the backs metal. Like even here, the the markers are attached to the magnetic to the glass board via magnets. And I go, oh, mag, oh, that's good. So now we're not uh, kind of tethered to something, a technology that becomes antiquated. Sure. And it's it's clean and simple. Um, so it's, but that, it's worked that well. That little attention, to, that's just one thing out of a gazillion things here that require that much detail. Yeah, it's so many of these things are just look going, it's like you're coming here, you're you're learning, and I go to other places, and I learn. It's just uh, identifying really good ideas and then applying them in your own life. It's, I don't know, I think that's kind if of If you're fun. an ophthalmologist and you're visiting Austin... <laughs> Send doc, send Doctor Shannon here an email and say, "Let me come visit." You're welcome. You'll be blown away. You're welcome to come. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Mm. Okay, so let's say there's a medical student watching, and they're considering, well, what kind of field should I should I go into? Do you have any advice to those medical students? You choose a field. It's going to make you happy. Something you're going to enjoy doing for the rest of your career. Don't choose a field like, well, I want to do neurosurgery because it's really cool. It's really well respected when they make a ton of money. If you're not willing to live that life, ask yourself what your career should be like. What would you want to do? There's no right and wrong field, obviously. If you want to do ophthalmology, you got like 460 spots in the U.S. a year. On internal medicine, you got, I don't know, 20,000. So certain derm, competitive. Urology, even 200-something spots. Neurosurgery, even 100. So the various fields are fewer and fewer spots. But just, you can achieve any of them. Just ask yourself, what do you want to do? Like, if I was stuck doing internal medicine for the rest of my career, I'd probably change gears and do something else. It's just not me. It's not enough hands-on, not enough math, not enough solving of the problem. Cataract, Solved. Chronic diabetes and hypertension and coronary artery disease treated every year forever, never solved. I don't like that. It doesn't fit with my personality. Mm-hmm. But mind you, we need those doctors too who are going to care for those patients and really give them the appropriate treatment to help minimize the impact of those diseases. So it's complicated, but you got to find your passion. Whatever makes you happy is what you, you should pursue. And there's challenges now, I'll tell you. Med students is a big challenge because the USMLE is no longer scored. It's pass fail for step one. A lot of med schools, almost most, have done away with grades, pass fail only. So you get out of it what you're going to put into it. And so if you you can just kind of skate by these days and just pass your classes, pass the USMLE, and you're good. So how do you think residencies identify top talent if Things have gone pass fail, and there's no standardized score. You know, that's a good question. I think it's it's figuring out who has the work ethic that's appropriate for your program. Listen, if you're in, if you're applying to ophthalmology, if you did med school, you're smart. You're, sm- you're smart, no question. Every ophthalmologist I met is smart. The question is, what's the work ethic, and do you match the ethos of that program? So you get a program that's very busy, very heavy. UT Southwestern, right? Great program. If you enjoy working hard, you can be sure if you're on call at Parkland Hospital, you're going to deal with a ruptured globe. I posted a video on Cataract Coach a couple of weeks, maybe a week ago, on a Sunday. One of my residents, in one night, two ruptured globes at the county hospital. That's work. It's a lot of work. But if you're in a small little boutique a residency with a tiny little hospital and, rotten, and no trauma center, you may not see any ruptured globes that night or, in fact, that month or even that year. So find, if you want a program that's going to spoon feed you, go find that kind of program. But just find the program that fits for you. 
There is no best ophthalmology residency program. Let me be straight here and tell you, absolutely. There's some are, they're, they're, they're all pretty good. But at the end of the day, it's the horse, not the track that wins the race. A good horse can race on any track. You could put, you could have put me as a resident in any residency program, I assure you, I will get about the same out of it because I'm self-motivated, mm -hmm. self-driven, and willing to work hard and learn on my own. Mm -hmm. Watch those videos. Find those VHS tapes like I used to do 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So the nonsense is like, well, this program is better than that program. Please. Coming from a program where I've spent, I was in residency there, plus 20-some years teaching there. It's a good program. Nothing magical about it. Mm -hmm. If you have a great medical student, they can do equally well here in, in Austin, in Dallas, in Miami, in you name it, Chicago. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. So where I went to my residency, it was not considered. It was the stepchild, nothing, no offense to stepchildren out there. It was the stepchild of residency programs in the city of Philadelphia. And the way I see it is it gave me an opportunity to learn and I taught myself so much. I would go to other programs in the city, watch videos back in the day. I would drive around. I would listen to audio cassettes of yeah. George wearing the third and Richard Lindstrom talking. This is late 1990s. Sure. So you learn by listening, but you, it's a process of self teaching. I just yeah. knew I needed to get more. So you can continue that with any program, anywhere. Yeah, so that's a really important point. Yeah. There is no magical program. There is no best residency program. I came and did a lecture last month in Tampa, at University of South Florida, the I Institute. Chairman is Ramesh Ayala. What an amazing program. It's not on the top 10 years, lists, but it is certainly a top 10 program. It is an amazing program. And the dedication they have to their residents and the amount of learning and the, how hard they work at Tampa General Hospital. Wow, wow, wow. Great program. Mm. And yet it's not quote on that map of the top 10. What, what makes a great program in your mind? Happy residents who work hard, are, are, are kind of teammates together. They're, so, they're all colleagues. And they learn a ton. And they learn by doing there's an attending there, Dr. Di Sclafani, who teaches them in their wet lab. They have a beautiful wet lab there that they've uh, prioritized funding to make sure the wet lab's great. And Dr. Di Sclafani puts his heart into making sure every resident spends X amount of hours a week in the wet lab, teaching them all the tricks. He had, when I was there, for Paul Singh, a glaucoma specialist from, uh, from Wisconsin, was there. He came, and so Di Sclafani set up to have all the, various, all the biggest companies there. He says, I want my residents to learn all of the MIGS devices, not just one. All the tools in the toolbox. That dedication, I think, is really important. And a smaller program like that, they, those faculty are incredibly dedicated. Mm -hmm. And they really care. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a really nice thing. So there are so many hidden gem programs that can do that. But remember, if I took a great resident from that USF program, he'd do great. Or she'd do great. If I put her at UCLA, she'd do great. I put her in basketball, she'd do great. If I put her in university in nowhere, in Nowheresville, she'd do great. Mm -hmm. It's the horse, not the track. Mm -hmm. It's the chef, not the kitchen. The chef makes the meal. It's not the kitchen that makes the meal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So get that, get that concept solid in your mind and don't sweat one program over the other. It's not that big of a deal. Is there anything else you want to talk about? You, I want to learn about this practice here and how this all evolved. This is, to me, magical. This is one of the prettiest and nicest facilities that I've ever visited. And some of the little details like behind us here, the open office where the doctors are sharing the same huge open f working space, mm. no, no boots, no cubicles, sharing it with all the staff members. I think that, was, that little touch is super important. Mm -hmm. Or the way you did things in the OR and how you plan it out. Tell us more about your clinic, because I'm sure you have a video of it. If you don't, you need to make a video of this place. I've made a video of it. It's a tour. It's called Tour of Our Westlake Office. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, but the idea of having the surgery center on the second floor, so well done. I mean, just choosing the general layout. Like, I love the front entrance. I love the sphere, the silver sphere, mm -hmm. like the eye sphere. That's, mm -hmm. love that. I don't know, who, who thought of that? Okay, so... 
let's set the table. If you want another background, um, it is the year 2016. We have two locations in Austin, Texas, but one of those locations was built in 1972. So it's, it's more than 40 years old and it's starting to show its age. And I thought to myself, Hmm, we should be able to do better than this. So over time, like I would, I would go to some hotels and some of them, some of them were very nice hotels. And I go, oh, I really liked some of the design in certain hotels. And I thought, well, you know, you only have one life. Um, let's kind of see what's possible. Sure. Um, I don't want to be just ordinary. So we were, I started looking around at a second location and I thought, well, maybe I should just lease space. That's what people do. They lease space. And I, I visited, I had visited by this time, like 10 or 12 different practices and looked at them, um, to get ideas of how they construct sure. things. Um, and we were looking and I thought, well, let's go to the a area where we do elective surgery. Let's go where people are most able to afford elective services and that's in this zip code. And, um, as I was looking at a piece of, uh, at some office space, um, I was looking at it with my dad and he says, why are you looking to lease? And I said, well, I want to, I want to have an office in this zip code. He goes, why don't you buy? I go, I didn't think of that. And so, all of a sudden, I started opening my eyes and driving around this zip code, looking for signs of for sale. Sure. So then we we found several properties, and then um, is actually my oldest brother. He he said, "Hey, Shannon, there's this building for sale," and we looked at this property. It, it was a building built in the 1980s, and um, it was kind of older, but it was located. Uh, at the entrance of a nice neighborhood and there's a stoplight and I go well, that's that's pretty good real estate is location 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 for sure okay so I go this is good location but it was a rundown office his older office and so we had to hire an architect to analyze the building and engineers to analyze the building and see what's possible and so they out a design and we go oh, that's pretty cool if we could build that and then um i always like these nice hotels and i wanted a i wanted i wanted some building where my kids would think it's it's a nice place because sure. they like new stuff they always thought one of our offices was kind of kind of old sure so i go okay well let's come up with a theme let's make everything here high tech modern and contemporary you nailed it okay. uh, perfectly. So then we said, well, I'll make it like a nice hotel, high-tech, modern, and contemporary. And so the architects used that. They ran with it. And that, then it was like 2017. And then we thought of like all these little things. So it's, it's like a, building a custom house. You can sure. do whatever you want. It's just you have to think about it and plan it. And so like there's a sphere in front of our building. I've never seen the Millennium Park Bean, or it's called... Uh, cloud gate in, in chicago, chicago. Yeah. but i've seen pictures of it i go oh that's so cool shiny and reflective and it's artsy how, how big is it what's the diameter of it uh our our sphere is only seven feet it yeah. looks so much bigger it was nice yeah. um and it's actually now google's identified it as a landmark they called it the rolling wood which is our neighborhood the rolling wood sphere i, I don't know it. but it's become a landmark um and so we came up with the sphere and then the signage that we had, it was all made by the same company. Uh, it's Ion Art in Austin, Texas. And they've, they've made some iconic signage elsewhere in the city that people take sure. Instagram posts of. Um, but that's kind of how that sphere came about. And um, yeah, we just visited a lot of other practices. We visited practices in Los Angeles and South Dakota and Dallas, um, wherever anybody would let me in and take a look. Um, and we just kind of brought all those ideas here. The reason why we like an open office is I think, you know, I, I always felt like 
when I grew up, there were a lot of practices had the doctors had their own office sure. in a corner. But I thought that's kind of like um, that's that doesn't connect you to anybody. A little isolating, yeah. Yeah, and you don't know what's going on. And here I am. I, I this is this is our practice, so I kind of want to know what's going on too. Um, so, and I want to be connected with our staff. So I thought we'll just make well. We all our offices have that theme. So I don't have my own office. I haven't had an office. Um, have I ever had a doctor's office? Maybe I did when I started, but I found it's better to be with everyone else, with everybody sure. else. So it's something as simple as how do people answer the phone? If you hear their language, you can maybe fine tune how they communicate sure. on the phone. Because if a patient calls the office, whoever they speak with on the phone, that's they're representing you. And For if sure. they can't express something, like if Peter Atia needs to explain cataract surgery maybe he couldn't do it yeah and so you can kind of hey let's uh let, let's figure out how we can kind of fine-tune your presentation you hear so many things conversations so you're very connected with what's going on at all times um it's worked well um i don't know if it's if other practices do this or not but uh i like it like how this. many square feet is facility is twenty little over twenty thousand. Wow. So the the office is on the f- clinics on the first floor, exam rooms on the first floor, LASIKs on the first floor, the ASCs on the second floor, um, and like we visited Jeff Whitman's practice in Dallas, and he has a two story building. It's like thirty thousand square feet, and we had to make that decision: do we build the ASC on the second floor or on the first floor? Because his ASC is on his first floor. There's pros and cons to each. We almost didn't build in this building because when we had the engineers look at it, sure. the engineer said, this building vibrates too much. That's, it's not going to, you can't do surgery here. Wow. And I go, what? That's a thing? And so I, I just went up to the building before we, I think before we even bought it. And I just started jumping on the second floor. And I go, I don't feel that much vibration. And plus, if I'm actually operating, I'm resting my hands on the patient's head. And I didn't think it would be a factor. And I I can't tell there's any vibration here. But if I would have listened to the engineer, it did not meet his specification. We wouldn't have been able to build. So that's some of the backstory. Tell me about that incredible TV. I want to watch, like, TV (laughs) in in your your lobby. So I made a video about that. It's called uh, The Wall. It's on. I posted it on YouTube. Samsung Wall TV. Um, Apple stores have big TVs. Sure. Have you seen them? Sure. Uh, so I went to the Apple stores here in Austin, and I just thought that was really cool because it was captivating and educational. And I looked at their TV, and I, I, I wasn't sure how to get one. So I, I went to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and looked at tvs and the one that was unique was made by samsung it's the samsung wall and it just has a a, it has a smaller distance between pixels each micro led it's the smallest so it's the most high res tv you can so what are the specs how how big is it what's the size it's 10 feet by six feet it's not as big as the apple store but the apple store is like half the resolution Mm. um so ours is is basically 4K, and I guess if you go to the Apple Store, it's it's more like a, a 1080p kind of situation. But it's good. So the patients come in, and it it's, it's, creates a nice ambiance. Um, and if you ever wanted to watch something or game or whatever, uh-huh. which which I don't do, you could use it <laughs> This is that. the place but it's, for I movie mean, night. It, it's, it's just the reason why I did it is I thought it was cool, and I thought, well, if you only live once, let's... Go, big, right. go yeah. big or go home. It's Texas, right? Everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's been great for football. <laughs> I haven't watched football games on it, but we, we could. Um, uh, um, but it's, yeah, I just wanted to create something nice. Well, you've done an incredible job. This facility is. Yeah. When do I move to Austin? <laughs> <laughs> I think they want you in California. Uh, so, um, tell, tell me about, uh, what do you do for fun? Obviously, this, this project was, I can imagine you spent, Probably in addition to working all day, 
to build this place another four, five, six, eight hours a day on this. So now this is finally wrapped up. How do you spend your time outside the clinic, outside the OR? Mainly, I just relax at home. I don't do much. I make videos like you. Sure. Um, I exercise. Um, but like our staff is kind of like our family. And so I'm, I'm like the... I'm the boss to our staff, but I'm, I'm kind of like a parent to our staff. I, I feel like I'm responsible for, for their livelihood, um, like a parent would feel about their own children, sure. or their well-being. So like the reason why I wanted to renovate or build a new office is I wanted to you know, retain and motivate um, our team. Sure. Um, what I've learned over time is like having a building a great, great team is everything because I can't do it by myself. But if I can build a great team, um, it's like a force multiplier. I, you can do a lot more. Um, so everything you see, it's it's not without a lot of work. But it's there's a lot of good people for sure who we've had to like recruit, train, develop, uh, motivate, incentivize. Um, but so yeah, I I. What do I do for fun? I like sports. Uh, I watch sports. I exercise. I sleep. Oh, um, I've seen your drone videos. You're, you're yeah, it's just, I like electronics. Like toys. So um, you need a new iPhone, I'm sure. But <laughs> I, I, like, I like Apple products. Sure. Um, you know, the drone, it kind of opened uh, my mind to videography and photography. I don't know all about photography, but I know how to like, like this podcast, I know how to set it up. Um, audio is important. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, this is why I'm, I'm not ready to retire because I don't really have enough hobbies outside of medicine to occupy my time. And I don't really know what to do. Well, that's but, a good question. Do, do you ever see yourself retiring and quitting off the mall? That's a great question. Everybody's got to retire. At some point, sure. Yeah, but. you can't do it forever. I, I, don't, I don't know. So, like, I'm, I guess it'll depend on what our kids do. Um, I guess that's, that's the next step. Um, I'll, so, unlike you, who started out in academics... Well, I started I, with practice too, day well, one. But, but you were doing academic Correct. teaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have, like I said, I haven't ever taught an ophthalmology resident since I was a resident. Yeah, I haven't. That's why to, the audience knows the yeah. reason why he has no gray hair and I have a lot is from <laughs> teaching residents. That's the only reason. Yeah, it's going to be stressful. We'll get you some nice gray hair. <laughs> It'll look good. A little bit of silver on the temple, Shannon. You'll look great, buddy. Yeah. So we're going to, we'll be having a residency program that we've uh, matched our first class wow when do they start uh, july of this year wow so yeah part of the concept is i'll teach some and i just want to want them to see kind of probably what you tried to show your residents kind of how big is the residency class possible. it's just three 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 per year so we'll see how that how, goes how many total faculty in, in this new department uh right now there's a full-time uh, faculty. Maybe equivalent. like five, five to six. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's just starting out. Um, so we'll, that'll take some time. Um, I don't know. Invest in some good people. Lure me over to, the, to Austin. I'll pay no state income tax. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> you and yeah, you and a lot of other people. It'll be an amazing, an amazing place. But so. No, that's a, it's a neat opportunity for you. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh -huh. There's a joy in teaching someone that skill. It's, yeah. There is a little stress involved, but there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction and joy in doing it. And to see that young, young surgeon start off a little iffy, and next thing you know, just start flying, and you're like, "Wow, that's um." To see that progression is amazing. Yeah, it, the, I think the the theme. I'm, I'm sure you felt this too. Is you can't do everything forever. So you, there is. I think it's kind of the human condition to pass it on, sure. pass it on to the next generation, whether it's having kids or teaching the next generation. Um, yeah, it's a way of kind of like leaving, yeah, leaving a future. Leaving a legacy for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
helping the next generation. I think our field is good about that. Ophthalmology is really good about one generation teaching the next. Mm -hmm. And that's really the kind of that tradition in ophthalmology as long as we've had ophthalmology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, we, I'm, I'm sure we've learned from many of the, the same people over time and it's been impactful and it's, it's helped shape our whole careers and our lives and we may not realize it, but yeah, there, there are a lot of influential people who helped us along the way and, uh, you know, you've helped a lot of people who will help the next generation. So that's kind of uh, maybe maybe uh, part of the next plan. Part of my favorite thing with teaching residents is continuing to mentor them and keep in touch with them after the culmination of the residency. Yeah, that's probably the fun part. That's the most fun of all. Because you're not under the stress part of, oh, my God, you're going right. to have a complication. To see them do amazing things. Yeah. It's really, it's such a pleasure. Even the ones who do things, even outside of cataract surgery. I was recently talking to a former resident who does oculoplastics in Phoenix. He was an amazing, amazing resident. He was the type where he already matched an oculoplastic, which you match early in PGY three year. Mm -hmm. But I give an award out for best resident surgeon of the year. Purely merit-based. I give him a cash award and the honor of it. As a senior, already having mastered in a plastic fellowship, he was like, oh no, I'm winning that award. I have to be the best cataract surgeon too. Hit that drive. <laughs> the guy who books 10 cataracts a day in the county hospital and then realizes that I don't mind. He says, he says, I'll grab the mop and mop the floor between cases. I'll go start all the IVs, no problem. Whatever it takes to get the things moving. So I was just talking to him and he was just saying how, how he's enjoying his career now. He's doing so well. All the things that I, t I said, listen, you're going to do amazing things in your career. You're going to hit these milestones. And he says, you're right. I just did. He says, I just want to thank you for being such an incredible mentor. And this is, you know, five years ago, six years ago. But to see the people you train and like, yeah, I taught him or her that first cataract surgery. And now that person's like on a podium giving a lecture. Ah, I'm like a proud dad in the background. Yeah, and it's pretty cool. That, that must be cool. Ah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It's one of my favorite parts of all of ophthalmology. So I'm so happy that you're going to be teaching residents. You will really, really enjoy it. We'll see. I'm a little nervous about no, it. No. I do think serious. it will stress me a little bit because, uh, yeah, I'm used to moving quick and you have to. So you have to slow things down. It's, it's like the way I've, the only analogy I can think of is it's probably like teaching your 15-year-old how, how to drive, drive a yes. car. Very appropriate. And analogy. you're like, oh my God, I'm going to get killed. Here's the difference, though. <laughs> you, you, you operate at the level of like an F1 race car driver, uh -huh. and you're teaching beginner driver's ed. So you got to tone it way down on this. Because what you can do in just a second or two may now be 10 minutes, five minutes. Mm -hmm. That Rexus that you just did six seconds and you're done. Mm -hmm. now that may be like, if you're lucky, 60 seconds. If it's a really skilled senior, but it may be 10 minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes. Yeah. So. So I've got that to look forward to. Um, oh, you'll love it. It's, it. No, it's a neat thing. Uh -huh. You'll really have a fantastic mm -hmm. time with it. I think it'll be a, one of the highlights for you. Mm -hmm. you'll, mm -hmm. you'll really, really get to enjoy it. We talked about this a little bit at dinner last night, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. important to maintain health and strength. Mm-hmm. As you're, as you're progressing through your career, don't neglect yourself. Yeah. More, to, more to, uh, to life than just ophthalmology, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I told you earlier how I took a few years off of doing all the traveling and consulting. Just spent time with my kids. And, and I was actually talking, after talking to Dick Lindstrom, and, and Dick said, he said, Uday, listen, prioritize that time. Your kids are going to grow up. They're going to leave the house. And chances are they're not coming back home, at least not for a while. And ophthalmology will still be here. And lo and behold, both kids now live on the East Coast for me, and I'm in, I'm in L.A., so they couldn't mm -hmm. be farther away. Mm -hmm. And ophthalmology is still here. Mm -hmm. He's right. I found that most of the things that Dick Lindstrom predicts are accurate. Oh, he's a brilliant guy. Brilliant. Yeah, very smart guy. Yeah, but to, to have a mentor like that, I think, is so important, too. Or to have people that you can reach out to. Mm -hmm. And another thing that people may not realize is, you can watch your videos, you'll reply to every email. If an ophthalmologist emails you, or an ophthalmologist emails me, an ophthalmologist emails Dick Lindstrom, or an Eric Donnerfield, or David Chang, do you know what? They reply 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. 
So not being afraid to just reach out and say, hey, could you spare five minutes to talk to me about this? Or I need your, I'd like to your input on this or that issue. People, for sure, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. For fellow ophthalmologists, we have a small, small community. Mm-hmm. Make me happy to see another ophthalmologist do well and whatever little pearl I could share that I learned from someone else. Mm-hmm. If I could pass that pearl on to you, mm-hmm. we'll help you too. Yeah. So it's a, it's a small world. I think I always say I'm, I'm thankful every day that I'm an ophthalmologist. It's just an amazing field. I don't know how we stumbled on this. We got so lucky. But even now, 20-something years into it, I still love what I do. I can't imagine not working. No, I think, I, I'm. of course, this is a 1,000% biased comment, but I mean, of all the specialties... I think ophthalmology is cool. I think it's high tech. Patients are very happy as a whole. Um, it's a it's a great profession. I think it's I think I think it's the best, and we're fortunate enough to do the coolest part of the best profession, which is refractive surgery, LASIK, cataract surgery, sure. lens lens replacement. It's just. I mean, we're, we've had to work very hard to get to this point, but it's, uh, I think we're, we're in the best part of the best field. I don't know if that's, I don't mean to say that in a bragging way, but it's like, I'm very thankful. Yeah, as am I. And I think we've yeah. each found our happiness, but hey, even if you don't like the cataract, you, you need retina, glaucoma, yeah. cornea, strabismus, yeah. oculoplastic, whatever you want. But I think it's just, a, I mean, it's such a, a beautiful field. I'm just thankful. And, it, you know, obviously it was the perfect fit for us. And um, certainly if you're a young, young doctor out there or resident or med student or even college student, if you're considering it, go for it. You will not regret it. Yeah, agreed. Well, Uday, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll end it. We're uh, a little over two hours in. Great perfect. talk. Perfect. That's Bye, a guys. wrap.